Hello and welcome once again to the Friday Film Show. As always, I'm your host David O'Sullivan and this is my weekly movie show in which I cover everything that's going on in the world of movies, or at least the movies that most interest me. And with that being said, let's get straight into this with opening this week. And as far as the new films that are opening today in the UK, we have Fast and Furious 8, The Handmaiden and The Sense of an Ending. So again, another quite mixed bag. Fast and Furious 8 actually was released here in the UK on Wednesday, or there were some kind of early previews on Wednesday. I could have seen it then if I wanted to, but to be honest with you, I'm just not that interested in Fast and Furious as far as the franchise is concerned. It's just, they're just not films that interest me. I'm just not really bothered about the Fast and Furious films. I mean, there are some big, dumb, fun action movies that I do really like and really enjoy, but as far as, as, far as Fast and Furious goes, I'm just, I just, I just can't get into them. They're not, they're just not really my thing. Um... It's one of the only big action movie franchises that I'm just really not bothered about at all. Transformers is another one I kind of gave up on that a long time ago. I'm really not bothered about Transformers anymore either. And Fast and Furious, I just I just can't really get into it. It's just not really my thing. So I'm not going to bother seeing Fast and Furious or doing a review for that. But I'm sure there's plenty of reviews out there for you to watch if you're interested in Fast and Furious. And also The Handmaiden is a foreign film. I think it was first released last year, but it's just getting its UK release now, just opening in cinemas today. I might go and see that. I've heard, I don't really know what it's about, but I've heard it's supposed to be really great, the film. And also The Sense of an Ending. And this is like a British kind of um, romantic comedy drama, I think. I did have a chance to go and see this for free the other week, actually. And I was going to go and see it. And I thought I had an assigned seat. And then I got there too late and it was absolutely packed. And I was like, you know what, forget it. I'm, I'm not that bothered. I, I may go out and check it out. I wasn't really that interested in seeing it. I mean, I saw the trailer. I liked the look of it. And I thought, if I can see it for free, I may as well go and see it. But then it was just so busy and I got there too late. I was like, yeah, you know what, forget it. I'm not that bothered. I, I may check it out. You know, it's out in cinemas now, but I, I, I'm not too sure. I, I was interested when I could see it for free. But now, like, oh, I, I don't know. But as far as a film that I have seen, I have actually seen a film this past week. It's not a new release. It doesn't open until next week, I think, but it's uh, Their Finest. It's another British film, I believe. And it's also kind of written by a female writer, directed by a female director, and starring a prominent female star in Gemma Arterton. And apparently, because I saw this film in an advanced screening, it was like a courtesy of the Bar Film Festival, um, because, you know, it's like a super early screening. It doesn't open for another week or so. And... Apparently that hardly ever happens that you get a film that's written, directed and starring a woman like that. The next time that happens apparently is Pitch Perfect Free. So, and I didn't know about that when I booked uh, my ticket to see the film. But then I heard about that, that it was had this kind of triple F rating, if you will. And I was like, wow, okay, I want to support it even more so. And it was actually a really great film. It's not open yet, but I really recommend seeing Their Finest when it comes out because it really was a breath of fresh air. It was it was a really great film. It was really funny as well. It, it was touching. It was emotional. It was dramatic. There were certain things that happened that really kind of shook me and like, you know, I, I, I really didn't see it coming. And it, yeah, it was just a really good time and very funny as well. The cast were great. Gemma Arterton, Sam Claflin, uh, Bill Nye, really kind of greatest hits of a kind of great British cast there. And Bill Nye really kind of stole every scene he was in. He was great. And I thought Sam Claflin was fantastic as well. And I thought Gemma Arterton was great in the lead role there too. So I really recommend seeing their finest when it does come out. I think it's next week it comes out because I got the chance to see it at that early screening and I actually really enjoyed it. So yeah, now going to a quick box office rundown here. And as far as the top 10 films, playing in the UK. At number 10, we have Logan, still holding on in there at the number 10 place there. I'm really happy about that. Number nine, Kong Skull Island. Number eight, Power Rangers. <laughs> I haven't seen Power Rangers yet. I I don't know if I'll see it or not. I, I might do, I don't know. Um, number seven, Fleur, Smurfs of Lost Village. Number six, Going In Style. This is one of the new releases. I haven't seen Going In Style. I think it's supposed to be kind of all right. Um, up there at the number six spot. Number five, Get Out. Still in the top five there. Number four, Ghost in the Shell. I'm surprised Ghost in the Shell is still that high actually as well because obviously not a lot of people seem to be uh, liking the film. Number three, Peppa Pig, my first cinema experience. I have no idea what that is. I don't know what Peppa Pig is, but I'm guessing that's a new release. I haven't heard of that. Some uh, kids thing there, I'm guessing. Uh, number three. Number two, Beauty and the Beast. And Beauty and the Beast has finally been dethroned. And... <laughs> <laughs> and number one is the Boss Baby. Who the hell saw that coming? You know, <laughs> Boss Baby at number one. 
okay, um, I mean, it's one of the only big new movies out right now. And it's, aside from Smurfs, it's the only kind of new kids' movies as well. So, and apparently Smurfs isn't that amazing. Um, I don't think Boss Baby is meant to be that great either, but there, there we go. Boss Baby seems to be crushing it at number one. Who saw that coming? But <laughs> Beauty and the Beast has finally been dethroned by none other than Boss Baby. And that's just my quick roundup there of the top 10 films in the UK box office. I'm now going on to movie news here. And I've got I picked out several items in, of movie news to look at here. Because aside from last week, there wasn't anything that big to talk about last week. But this week, so much kind of big uh, news has dropped as far as casting. And so many things have, uh, have landed this past week. So I had to narrow it down to seven because there was so much stuff I wanted to talk about. But as far as the first piece of news goes... Apparently Carrie Fisher will appear in Star Wars Episode 9 according to brother Todd Fisher. Now if I look at what he said here exactly, it was... Both of us were like, yes, how do you take her out of it? And the answer is you don't. She's as much a part of it as anything. And I think her presence now is even more powerful than it was like everyone. When the saber cuts him down, he becomes more powerful. I feel like that's what happened with Carrie. I think the legacy should continue. And... I do agree with him. I think she should, she should still continue to be a part of the saga. Obviously, she not long passed away at the end of last year. And it would be odd for her to suddenly just not be in it anymore. And as far as his comments go, I think there were some other comments for Leak as well. Saying that Carrie Fisher's uh, Princess Leia or General Organa will be in episode 9 as well. And a lot of people were scratching their heads like, well, how, how is that going to happen? Because she only shot you know, scenes for episode 8, so how the hell are they going to have her in episode 9? They said they're not going to do CGI, they're not going to go that route, so it was like, okay, what are they going to do here? And I think, I may be wrong here, but I think what they're going to do is they're going to take the scenes that she shot for episode 8 and kind of stretch it out over episode 8 and 9, so instead of her story for episode 8 just being the story in that film, they're going to spread her story from that film across both of those films now. So she's going to have scenes in episode 8 and episode 9. And I think that'll make sense. Obviously, they're going to have to tweak some things there because she was going to have a, a big presence in episode 9 and she didn't get to shoot those scenes, I don't think. So instead, they're going to kind of slightly tweak it and alter it so that her, her story from episode 8 will now spread across into episode 9. And I think that makes sense because that way they don't have to do CGI or put CGI layer in there. Or that she doesn't have to just suddenly not be in it anymore. I think it makes sense to kind of... Um, slightly tweak her her storyline so that the scenes that she shot for episode 8 now spread across over into episode 9 as well so instead of all those scenes just being in that one film they'll now be spread across over both of those two films and I think I think that makes sense I think that's the best way to go like I said they're going to have to tweak some things and change some things they can't do what they were initially going to do now they're going to have to slightly change their story a bit but I think that's the best way to do it if that's what they're going to do and I think that's probably what they're going to do I think that's the best way to go about it and that makes sense that way we can have it in both episode 8 and 9 I'll just have to tweak it a bit so that you know this it makes sense story-wise but I think I think that's the best way to go about this and also we have that 2019 could feature the release of as many as six Batman themed live action animated movies um live action and animated movies and I don't know if this has been confirmed or not because obviously it is the 80th anniversary for Batman in 2019 so it makes sense that they would do something really big kind of um Batman related stuff in 2019 but I don't know if we're going to get six Batman movies in one year that just seems a little bit kind of like not very realistic uh, I think we probably will get the Batman the kind of live action Ben Affleck starring uh movie in 2019 that would make sense because there's been some complications of it it keeps getting kind of pushed back and I feel like it would make sense to kind of instead of go ahead and you know put it into production and release it next year I think it makes sense and taking their time and maybe releasing it 2019 to line up with the anniversary I think that'd be a really good way to go about it having the Batman come out in 2019 to mark the 80th anniversary for the character as far as there being six Batman movies I mean maybe there'll be a couple of animated movies I could see that happening maybe Gotham City Sirens will drop 2019 as well and that's kind of Batman related you know Batman villains um yeah obviously they're going ahead with like a Batgirl movie Nightwing movie maybe if they all go into production next year we could see them all land in the same year but I don't think that's going to happen because like I said they're going to have to put all these movies into production and they're all going to have to come out all within one year and I, I can't see that happening it would be cool to have all these different Batman movies like a Batman, Batgirl, Nightwing, Gotham City Sirens but I don't think they would you know even if they could do that I don't know if they would do that because 
even if they could put them all into production and release them all in within one year, I don't think they would do that because what's the point in kind of releasing like four or five, six films all within the same year? That's just that's just nuts. I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. But I could see the Batman dropping in 2019. I think that would make sense. Maybe Gotham City Sirens as well or one of those other spin-offs. I don't think they're all going to come out that same year. I don't think that would make sense either, but I think it would make sense for at least The Batman to come out in 2019 to mark the 80th anniversary. I think that would be really cool to see. And next up is that Dwayne The Rock Johnson teases Black Adam an eventual crossover with Shazam. And if we look at what he said here... What we decided to do was to create a scenario where Black Adam has his own standalone movie and where Captain Marvel, Shazam, has his standalone movie. We're building our world that way and then when we come together at some point. Uh, we've had great discussions with Jeff Johns over at DC. This is a really fun, cool time for DC right now because they're world building. We're seeing that of Wonder Woman and Aquaman. We have a few surprises down the line. And yeah, I um, mean, it's, you have to take this with a grain of salt because they've been talking about kind of Black Adam for like years now. I mean, it's still not happening yet. I think it's going to happen at some point. I'm not sure when because, you know, they're busy with like Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Flash, Batman, Justice League, all this kind of stuff. I do want to see a Black Adam movie and it's just that movie. I think I like those characters. It would be really cool to see those characters brought to life in live action. And Dwayne Johnson as Black Adam as well. And actually for the idea of Black Adam having his own movie as well. I think that would be pretty cool to see. And pretty different as well. Having the villain being introduced in his own film first. And then seeing him you know, come into his own as the villain in the Shazam movie as well. Um, or maybe not. Maybe having Shazam being in his own separate film. And then them coming uh, crossing paths in an eventual uh, movie down the line or Black Adam popping up in a Superman movie or or whatever I think it could work and I, I think I, I would like to see it happen you know a Black Adam movie and a Shazam movie I don't know if it's definitely going to happen because like I said we've been hearing about this for so long now they keep talking about oh it's going to happen you know they're doing a really great job at world building and um, I hope we do see it I'm not, I, like I said it, if we do see this happen, I don't know if it's going to be anytime soon because they've got all these other movies they're working on and all these other movies in the can, all these other movies that are going to be coming out very soon. I don't know at what point we'll get a Black Adam or Shazam movie, probably not to like 2020 at the earliest. I don't know, but I, I would want to say this. I, I really like Dwayne The Rock Johnson. It'd be really cool to see him as Black Adam in his own movie. So I am actually up for this and I hope I hope it does happen at some point because I am looking forward to seeing this and I think it could work if they do it well. At next up, and this is a really big piece of casting news we got, is that Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them sequel cast Jude Law as the young Albus Dumbledore. And I absolutely love this news. I've been thinking for so long who they're going to cast as a young Dumbledore because you all know that this series now... Uh, new it's probably still going to factor into it somehow, but we all know that this series is going towards a kind of kind of Dumbledore versus Grindelwald, you know. And they've got Johnny Depp there as a young Grindelwald, and we're like, who's going to be Dumbledore? Who's going to play the young Dumbledore? We didn't see Dumbledore in Fantastic Beasts. We thought he might have been like cheesy. We kind of referenced a couple of times, but now we're going to have a young Dumbledore in the sequel, and it's been announced. Jude Law has been cast as young Albus Dumbledore and I love this news I never it never once crossed my mind or I never once thought of Jude Law playing young Dumbledore but since I heard that I'm like I love that I think that is a great idea because he's the perfect age he's not too old he's not too young either he's in that perfect uh, age range there and he's a great actor and Despite being kind of, you know, he's not that old of an actor, but he's got that gravitas there. He's, he'll be able to sell that character to us. Because any other actor, there's probably like a lot of other actors in their kind of 40s that you could throw into the mix there. But I don't know if they'll really be able to sell the fact that they are Dumbledore. You know, even though this is a younger Dumbledore, he still needs to have that kind of, I don't know, that, that power to him. And I think... Jude Law will be able to convey that whilst at the same time being a kind of younger, maybe more vulnerable version of the character because I'm not really kind of overly familiar with the history of his character, how Dumbledore was when he was younger. But to see Jude Law as a young Dumbledore going up against uh, Johnny Depp as Grindelwald, I cannot wait to see that. I know the series is going to be heading in that direction and I'm even more excited now because I think that is such great casting, having Jude Law as the young Dumbledore, so I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And as far as comments were released here, it said that Jude Law is a phenomenally talented actor whose work I have long admired and I'm looking forward to finally having the opportunity to work with him. 
director David Yates said in a statement. I know he will brilliantly capture all the unexpected facets of Albus Dumbledore as J.K. Rowling reveals this very different time in his life. Yeah, I just cannot wait to see it because it's going to be Dumbledore, but not Dumbledore as we know him. He's going to be younger. Maybe he's going to be a little bit more reckless, a little bit, a little bit more kind of you know, not as kind of wise and in control as you know the uh, Michael Gambon version. And yeah, you know, because I initially thought of oh, what if we have kind of uh, Jared Harris play the young Dumbledore? Because obviously his dad, Richard Harris, played Dumbledore in the original two movies. But then since this is kind of like the younger version of the Michael Gambon Dumbledore, I think Jude Law is perfect. I think I think Jared Harris could have played a really good young version of the Richard Harris Dumbledore. But as far as the Michael Gambon Dumbledore, I think Jude Law is perfect. He can kind of, he can play kind of soft and quiet, but he can also play kind of fierce and dominant and in control as well. I think he'll be really great, so I cannot wait to see this. And next up, another really big piece of casting news here is that Thanos actor Josh Brolin has signed on to play Cable in Deadpool 2. And who the hell saw that coming? This really came out of nowhere just the other day. I was online and suddenly, like, I saw a comment, wait, Josh Brolin is Cable? Wait, what the hell? Where the hell did that come from? Because... <laughs> As far as we knew, though, he wasn't in the running. He obviously was, but you know, we'd heard David Harbour, we heard Michael Shannon, Brad Pitt, possibly. And um, I've got to be honest with you, I was never that, that crazy about any of these names. I'm like, yeah, Michael Shannon's great, but I just can't really see him as Cable. I don't know if that's going to work. But Josh Brolin, I think this is my favourite of any of the actors that were brought up to possibly play Cable, other than maybe Stephen Lang. But you know, Stephen Lang is probably a little bit too old. They're kind of going for an actor more in his kind of mid to late 40s who could play the character for like, you know, quite some time in his own movies as well. X-Force maybe, and maybe Cable spin-off. And I think Josh Brolin is perfect. My only reservation with Josh Brolin, it's a, it's a silly little thing really, is his height. He's, he's quite short, you know, he's shorter than Ryan Reynolds. Um, and Cable was this massive guy, but you know, movie magic, you know, he's not going to look short in the film. I mean, Tom Hardy played Bane, this massive, big Batman supervillain, and he was only like 5'8 or 5'9, and he looks way bigger in that movie when he's going up against Batman, so that's not a big deal, really, you know. I would prefer to cast someone who was actually really big and tall, but at the end of the day, it's about the acting ability, and Josh Brolin is a great actor. He's, he's you know, he, he is, he's been in a lot of very different things, um... But what, what comes to mind, oddly enough, is Men in Black 3. I think he was really great at playing the younger Tommy Lee Jones in that. And that's when he really stood out to me. I mean, he was also in other things. Like, he was in the True Grit remake, I think. And he's been in a lot of things over the years. He was in Inherent Vice as well. He was really good in that. So he's, been in, he's done a lot of very different roles, very different films. But yeah, when I saw him in Men in Black 3, I'm like, God, he is so good. I mean, you genuinely believe he was a young uh, Tommy Lee Jones, and he did a great job in that film, despite the fact that he was like in his like mid forties and he's meant to be playing kind of Tommy Lee Jones when he was in his late twenties or something. But he did a great job, and um, if he can bring that to Cable, I think it'll be really great because he can play serious and dramatic, but he can also uh, play funny as well. Like he's, I think he's got kind of good comedic chops, but he's also got that kind of serious deadpan face, you know. Sicario as well, that was another and that actually funny enough, Sicario is probably a better comparison actually, because Sicario is one where he's playing quite a dark, serious, intense character, but he comes across very kind of in this very jovial kind of manner, like like very light hearted and you know, he's not really taking it seriously, but he's actually quite a dark character doing some kind of bad stuff with Benito del Toro there. But he's kind of very funny at the same time. And if he can bring that kind of thing to cable, because we need someone who can do comedy, but at the same time you know, someone who can do comedy and kind of riff off Ryan Reynolds, but at the same time can play that kind of serious, straight-faced, deadpan, kind of polar opposite to Deadpool. And I really think, of all the names that I brought up, Josh Brolin is going to is gonna smash it. I think he's going to be great, so I cannot wait to see that. And as far as, like, you know, his face shape is concerned, I can really see him as Cable, you know, with all the makeup and everything. I think he'll be really great, so... Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing Josh Brolin as Cable. I think it's going to be great. And next up is that the Americans arrive in the first look photos from Kingsman, the Golden Circle. And I just saw this the other day and I thought I may as well include this because um, I really enjoyed Kingsman. We've got some our first look at the cast in photos from the sequel here. And yeah, we've got Tara Edgerton is back. Obviously kind of the breakout star of the first Kingsman. And... The new American characters, we've got Channing Tatum in there, we've got Halle Berry, and yeah, 
I'm really looking forward to seeing this because I, I really enjoyed the first Kingsman and it's going to be really cool to see this kind of different take on the second one. And Matthew Vaughan's coming back as well, so I'm really glad about that. If Matthew Vaughan wasn't coming back, I'd be more like, oh, I'm not too sure about this. Because, uh, you know, he didn't come back to do Kick-Ass 2. You know, he did the first Kick-Ass, but... Um, a lot of the time he doesn't come back for the sequel like he did he did X and First Class, he didn't come back with Days of Future Past, he did Kick Ass, he didn't come back for Kick Ass 2. But the fact that he's coming back for Kingsman 2 is great because you know you can tell he's really into this property. This really is his baby and he wanted to come back and do the sequel and I'm really looking forward to seeing this. It looks great and they're doing a different spin on it where the first one was more about kind of the British Kingsman and this one's bringing in to kind of the, the American Kingsman almost. And all this, it's, like, it's an insane cast, like a really crazy, wacky cast. And Colin Firth's coming back as well. I'm not sure how they're going to tie his character back into it. I'm sure they'll do it in a way where, oh, that was cool. I don't think about that. I mean, it's going to be quite, you know, at the end of the day, Kingsman is quite a ridiculous, over the top thing. Maybe he was shot in the head, maybe. Uh, spoilers, you know, Colin Firth did die in that first film. Maybe he had a clone. Maybe. I, I don't know how they're going to come back. Maybe he did fake his death. Maybe it, it looked like he was shot and he wasn't actually shot. I have no idea how they're going to do it. But Colin Firth coming back, I'm so glad about that. Because even though it's like, hang on a minute, he was shot in the head. How is he going to come back? I'm so glad they're bringing him back. And all these are new kind of American cast members as well. I think it's going to be really good. And this first look is getting me more excited to see it as well. So there we have it. And lastly, movie news here is obviously we had Star Wars Celebration kicked off yesterday. I watched the kind of live stream last night. It was so great. The 40th anniversary panel there. We got our first glimpse of Star Wars The Last Jedi BTS footage in touching tribute to Carrie Fisher. And obviously I've got that as a new story, but just talking about the 40th anniversary panel as a whole, it was it was great. You know, um, the live stream was a bit annoying. Obviously I wasn't there. I was watching the live stream and um, but aside from issues with the last stream, uh, the live stream, because, you know, last year it was quite underwhelming. I could have gone to it last year. It was in London, like just like an hour up the road. I could have gone. I'm glad I didn't because it was really underwhelming. Like that Rogue One panel, they showed a feature it and that was it. I'm like, what? Um, and there was a little teaser, I think, that was leaked online with Vader. But this year, oh my God, it was so good. Across 40 years since Star Wars, 1977 to 2017, that 40 year anniversary panel. And obviously there was no big announcement. Obi-Wan movie. That may still happen. I don't know. But a lot of people are saying, we're going to get these big announcements of big movies coming. I'm like, eh, I don't think so. This is about celebrating 40 years of Star Wars. And that's really what it was. It was really kind of a celebration celebrating 40 years of Star Wars George Lucas came on there they've got all the actors on board as well all they all came onto stage and just talking there it's just so great because I'm not a crazy diehard you know fanatic of Star Wars or anything I do really like Star Wars but watching that panel made me realize how much I really do love Star Wars and having George Lucas there talking about it and talking to the actors as well it, it was so great bringing them all on there Mark Hamill Harrison Ford his first ever kind of Star Wars celebration it was it was so good and that that tribute to Carrie Fisher was so great there were so many times like I didn't realize how how much I love Star Wars and how passionate I was about Star Wars until I watched that live stream last night I was in tears so many times I'm like wow maybe I love Star Wars more than I realized because like I said I'm not a crazy you know Star Wars fan like I'm not one of these crazy diehard fans but you know watching that live stream I was so many times when I was almost tearing up and having Billy Lord come on there as well, as well doing that very emotional speech uh, to Carrie Fisher and I can't even imagine what she's going through to lose her mum and her grandmother at the same time I mean oh my god and she just came across so kind of just composed and strong and in control I mean how the hell that she could do that I don't know just like a few months after her mum and her grandmother die and then she's doing that and she did a fantastic job and yeah I thought it was a great panel a great way to celebrate 40 years of Star Wars and I thought it was absolutely fantastic hopefully we'll be getting the last Jedi trailer soon maybe it's already dropped I don't know but um yeah I thought it was great uh, I really wish I could have been there <laughs> A bit of a pain, really. Only if this was like last year and I could have gone to it in London. But um, like I said, I'm not a crazy Star Wars fan, so I'm like I'm not that disappointed. 
you know, I much rather go to someone like, say, Comic Con, but it would have been so awesome to, to have been there. And of course, John Williams coming on at the end there, it was it was so great. You know, when the curtain rises, everyone's like, woo! And then he's just like, and everyone just goes quiet, and then the music starts. It, it was perfect. It was just pitch perfect. It was beautiful, emotional. I, I absolutely loved it. And even though I kept getting stuck down over the bloody live stream, kept playing up all the time. It was it was really emotional watching that and I think it was really fantastic. So there you go. That's my diatribe there about the 40 year anniversary Star Wars celebration panel and a new movie trailers. Of course, another thing, another massive thing that dropped this week, the trailer for Thor Ragnarok. Oh my god. I mean coming into this, I wasn't that excited to be honest with you. You know, um if you told me months ago Okay, we're going to get trailers for Justice League, Spider-Man and Thor Ragnarok. Which one are you going to get most excited about after watching them? I would not have guessed Thor. Because like, I like the trailers for Spider-Man and Justice League, but watching them I was kind of like, hmm, yep, it's kind of what I expected. Oh, it looks good, I guess. Okay, I'm looking forward to them. But watching that Thor Ragnarok trailer, oh my god, I got so excited. I was like, oh, and I was already really looking forward to Thor, but I was more intrigued than just full on excited because I don't really know for sure what it was exactly going to be like and I was like I, I gotta see this first trailer and then I watched that trailer and oh my god I fanboyed out I was like this looks absolutely amazing and I'm probably more I mean I am I'm way more excited for Thor than I am Justice League or Spider-Man I mean I'm looking forward to Justice League and Spider-Man but that Thor trailer oh my god it blew me away and obviously a lot of people are comparing it to guardians and i understand that i mean it does look kind of guardians-esque with the colors the music the humor but you know when i watched it i didn't funny enough guardians didn't come to my mind it just looks it just looks like i don't know taika watiti's take on a kind of a 70s 80s style sci-fi fantasy some of those the visuals in this trailer Oh my god, I mean, obviously the CGI that hasn't been finished yet, but just his awesome, crazy, psychedelic, retro, 70s, 80s, sci-fi, fantasy, visuals, the, the Valkyries, is it, I think, on the horses with the swords flying, Hella there with the big headdress, I'm like, this looks absolutely incredible, this is what I wanted Thor to be, this is what I wanted the second Thor to be, I was hoping the second Thor would be like this, crazy going to all these other worlds seeing all these new things and then we saw hardly any of the other worlds it was mainly all on earth again i'm like what why did you do that and it looks like with this one now they're just scrapping earth and all the human characters completely and it's going to be almost all entirely on these other worlds with these otherworldly beings i'm like yes this is what i wanted the last four movie to be i don't hate the dark world but this i'm so glad to go in this direction you know being almost all entirely on the other worlds with these otherworldly characters i cannot wait it does look great and obviously hulk in there as well we're going to get the planet hulk kind of thing there and i just you know kate blanchett as hella everything about this i think looks absolutely fantastic and i've got to admit when those pictures were first released um a few weeks back i'm like what ah I, I i wasn't a fan of those pictures i was like what the hell i don't what is this but then i see this trailer i'm like I, i'm sold it's one of those instances when you see pictures and you're like oh i don't know how i feel about it. i think that's gonna work but then you see emotion in a trailer and you're like this looks absolutely incredible i cannot wait to see this i'm a massive fan of taika watiti what we do in the shadows hunt for the women of people that came out last year it was one of my favorite films of last year it was great and i'm really big fan of his style of comedy as well because I'm not a big fan of comedy films nowadays but I love Taika Waititi's style of comedy and I think he's really going to bring that to this movie and I think it's going to be so awesome I cannot wait and also we got a new trailer release for Atomic Blonde starring Charlie Theron um this is the second trailer and yeah, it looks great. It, it basically does look like female John Wick. I'm like, everyone's comparing to John Wick. I'm like, oh, let's watch this trailer. It, it practically is female John Wick. And I'm not complaining because it looks awesome. I think Charlie Theron is really great at playing these strong, kick-ass female characters. And I think it looks really good. It may not be the best film of the year. It may not be like the greatest film ever. But as far as delivering kick-ass action, obviously one of the uh, directors of John Wick is doing this film. So it's definitely going to be like John Wick. So female John Wick, starring Charlize Theron, kicking ass. Got James McAvoy in there as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm all in. This looks awesome. 
And yeah, wrapping up now with this week in review, as far as my top five films currently playing in cinemas, it's, it's basically the same as last week because I haven't seen any of the new releases. Um, and as I said, their finest hasn't been released yet in cinemas. But number five, Ghost in the Shell. Number four, Beauty and the Beast. Number three, Free Fire. Number two, The Lost City Z. And number one, still my favourite film of the year, is Logan. Um... But I'll give my film of the week to Lost City Z this week. Uh, I've already given it my film of the week before, but I think it's now out in the US, I think. And I think Lost City Z is one of the best films of the year, Rise Up There and Logan for me. So, yeah, my recommendation, uh, my film of the week for this week would be The Lost City Z. So there we go, that wraps up this week's instalment of the Friday Film Show. If you've got any other thoughts on any of the, kind of the movie news stories or trailers or anything that I discussed in this week's episode, please let me know in the comments down below. And if you missed last week's episode, be sure and click on, to click over here to watch last week's episode. And as always, if you like this and you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe to see more. But for now, I've been David O'Sullivan. I'll see you next time. <laughs>